to what I want to say tonight. But in the book of Colossians, chapter 4, it tells us in verse 6, Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. And in order to be able to answer every man, it's pertinent that we know (coughs) how to respond to different people. Because you know yourself, if you've got children, you can speak harshly to one and it won't affect them. But you speak harshly to another and it will deeply offend them. So we have to learn that. And as difficult as it is, that's what we have to learn. So let me read it in context. Masters, give unto your servants that which is just and equal, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. (coughs) Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. Always praying also for us that God would open to us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in bonds, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. All my state shall shall Tychicus declare unto you, who is a beloved brother and a faithful messenger and fellow servant in the Lord whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose, that he might know your estate and comfort your hearts. So I'll end there. (coughs) Our words. Back in the mid-60s, an experiment was conducted in Stanford Research Institute in California by the CIA, Stanford Research Institute is basically a university, or they call it a, call it a university, but it's actually a front for the CIA where they train all their spies and agents. <coughs> it's interesting what they actually teach them there. Because you will, if you understand their curriculum, they go into and they teach you physics, metaphysics. What is metaphysics? the realm of the spirit about military terminology they teach you the science of how things work you might not realize it but on one of my CDs that I put out a long time ago on technology and this is going back 15-20 years on one of those CDs you will see how they took all of these young guys They took them into Stanford Research Institute and they taught them how to read minds. And it's what's called remote viewing. And what they did, one end of the university, they chose some guys and put them in this area. Now, none of them were psychics, just average people chosen off the street. They put them in one classroom at the end of this university. (coughs) They took another group of guys, again, just average people, put them down in another room, something like 500 meters apart. Then they told the guys down this end, we want you to have a look at this picture and we want you to draw it on a piece of paper. So they sat them in this room And they taught the other guys down the other end of the university how to remote view. Now you might not realize it, but it is one of the fastest growing, fastest expanding industries in America right now. Remote viewing. And you will see if you get on the internet scientists teaching you how to view the future, how to remote view the past, and how to view things on the other side of the earth. And it's not psychic. 
You may not realize it, but they took a soldier, a man by the name of Colonel David Morehouse, who came out of Desert Storm in 1991 and had a bullet go into the side of his temple, surrounded through the inside of this uh, brain, came out and exited on the other side of the temple. It destroyed part of his brain and the neurons of his brain. But from that moment on, this guy was able to see remotely. He could see anywhere in the world. You say, how can that be? What you don't understand, or what you should, and what you probably will if you stop to think about it, like all of us would, it's just logic, is this world is not just a physical creation. We just happen to live here in the the physical side of it. But there is a spiritual creation. And we know that nothing is solid. Science teaches us that nothing is solid. It is only held together by molecules that attract and hold themselves together. So any solid object is actually not solid. It's just a whole lot of particles joined together, held together in unison. And the truth of it is, if you can displace that molecular structure and part those molecules, you could drop sand on an iron bar and it'll fall through the other side. You just need to dissipate the molecular structure and you can do it. As surprising as that is. See? So what is impossible to the natural mind is not po- impossible to the spirit realm. Remote viewing, they found, once they began to see how it worked, they took a platoon of soldiers and they created a platoon of soldiers that can remote view under the command of Colonel David Morehouse. David Morehouse now has retired and many of the soldiers that were in his battalion that he commanded in the CIA have now retired also. They have set up a company and you can get on the internet and you can check it out and it's called Remote Viewing Services International Limited. And you can go on there and you can hire their effort, their knowledge. And they will come in and they will tell you anything that's happening anywhere in the world and they're not in trance and they're not in meditation. They sit around a table and they'll tell you what's going on. One will begin to draw something and the other will add something and a group of them and they will begin to tell you formulas. It'll cost you several million dollars to get them but I tell you what, if you don't get the answer, go on their website and have a look. They'll give you your money back. It's a money back guarantee. We have no idea what's going on. Remote viewing. If you get on YouTube, it'll take you to top scientists who are teaching this right now, especially in NASA, right at the highest and the top level, the aeronautics and space administration. These things are not just figments of imagination. These are realities being used and operated now. So that company still operates with a far, far greater and broader spectrum of authority in the CIA and it's called PSYOPs, Psychological Operations. Now what they did, and you'll see it on my CD, this is going back 20 years, they sat these guys in down here and they said, look at this picture and then draw it. They didn't tell them what it was, They drew the picture as they copied it on a piece of paper. And the guys down in this other room were told to spend a little time and think about this group of guys that's down the other end of the building and draw what you think they are writing on a piece of paper. And taught them just by concentrating the mind totally awake, no trance, no meditation, nothing like that, just concentration of thought. Taught them how to be able to access the information and remote view what is taking place down there. Because you see, one of the things I've found about the prophetic gift, 
you're dealing in an area that we do not understand and to walk up to somebody and say to them as I've done many times the Lord is saying go to Brussels and in three years you will have a church there or go to Jamaica and you will have five churches there and then they ring me five years later and tell me to come and visit them and the churches that I spoke over their life what am I doing? I'm speaking something I don't know. But I believe as I am speaking it out that I am revealing something that God, if my heart is in unison with God, and I am doing that by the power of God's Spirit, as I speak it, I am speaking reality into existence. It's what's called creative. The power of creative speech. Now you and I are all being given this because the nature of God is in us. It can destroy but it can also heal and help. you just got to make sure that you're tapping into the right source and you're speaking in faith. But I, like you, when I started this journey many years ago, God would put something, drop some thought into my heart and I would stand there and I would have a name and I would look at a person and I'd think, now, is this for real? Is this who they are or is it not? And with fear, I was afraid to say it. So I wouldn't say anything and I'd walk away only to stand down the back of the hall or a church later on and hear them talking to somebody and somebody else would call them by their name and I thought, that's the name God gave me. I should have spoken it out. So not only did it destroy the blessing for them to know that God knows about them, but it also destroyed, because I wouldn't take the step in faith and speak it out, it also destroyed the confidence in my gift because I was too afraid to say it. And what these guys are doing in the military through remote viewing is tapping into the spirit realm and just learning that the physical world is not the limitation that we think it is. There's a whole different world. Now they're touching it and they're tapping into it. And the church is somewhere behind the eight ball because of fear. These guys are being trained to do this and fear has no place in it. You join the CIA and you join a lot of these operations and go in there and if you fear, the first thing they'll do is turf you out the door. It wouldn't even allow you to be a candidate because fear is what will destroy your ability to succeed in what you're doing. So in the, in the negative world, in the spirit world, other than the Christian spirit world, they understand the principles. They're operating them. We are here, the very sons and daughters of God, who are given the mandate and the creative power of God, and fear binds us up. So these guys, in this end of this university, drew these pictures. And they drew a picture like a water tower, with a hook hanging off it, with eight wheels and tracks they drew little buildings alongside and as they drew these buildings in their positions these guys were told down the other end of the room just focus and draw what you think these guys are drawing down there you'll see the pictures it's the actual pictures taken in the experiment on my CD where they began to teach them how to remote view. And these guys down here, just as they concentrated and drew what they thought these guys were drawing, you'll see both pictures. It's amazing. Absolutely amazing. And what it was, was an atomic warhead silo filmed by satellite over Russia and here were the tracks that took this thing into a hole and into a cave in a mountain through all the buildings as the track this thing that was standing up like a big water tower with a big hook was the actual crane that lifted it and ran on tracks and these guys down here drew the exact same thing that these guys down here had copied they don't know how it works But do you know how faith works? Because I don't. 
All I know is that if God tells me to step out in faith and operate, to be obedient to that, not understanding like Abraham, not knowing where he was going, believe God. And to him, it was accounted for righteousness. That word account means God put into his bank account, imputed to him, gave him faith and righteousness. How do you step out into the gifts of the Spirit? Exactly like that. You pray and trust and ask God to help you. And just like these guys down there at this end, trying to concentrate on what they thought these guys were writing, somehow both pictures aligned. They were tapping in to some principles that operate in the spirit world, but they were doing it by another source. You and I have the Spirit of God. We have the mind of Christ. Yet most of us don't do it. Should I say can't do it? No, no. Not can't do it. Won't do it. Because the truth of it is, you and I can do it if we had the courage to step out and do it. The difference is that in the university and in the CIA and these different universities where they're teaching them, Fear doesn't even come into it. And as I said before, you exercise fear or you demonstrate fear when you're training to be a spy and you'd be out that door that fast, you wouldn't even get to second base because they know what fear does. Yet we live with it and we tolerate it. You see, let me turn to another scripture now. Remember I said the particular scripture that I was giving to you here was this one about your words. Speaking wholesome words. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. You see, our problem when we speak is we don't stop to consider things. Somebody says something, we reef off. Somebody gives a command, our emotion takes over, we rebel. Somebody says to us, I love you, and because in the past they've let us down so many times and we don't trust them, we might hear them, but we decide already to write it off because I don't believe them. Okay. Rather than this, is how we should respond. As James tells us, always ready to hear, slow to speak. And by hesitating with our response, we stop and consider what has just been said and how do I appropriately answer and respond. But we don't do that. If we would learn that simple lesson just to hesitate and people tell us all our lives, stop and count to ten. We consider it a joke. You tell people now, and you mention that over most pulpits and most people would laugh at you. I'm not saying that they would write it off. I'm saying they would laugh. They would joke. They know exactly what you're saying. But do they do it? No. Let your speech be always with grace, not reaction, seasoned with salt, preserved, kept, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. And the only way you'll learn to do that is by taking time and taking thought. Now fear should never ever have any hold over us because there's all these emotions with which we will respond given the opportunity. If the person comes to us and the person is a tyrant, we will immediately kowtow to them and allow them to speak the meaning to us and we will be very, very careful how we answer. Why is that? It's because of intimidation and fear. That's why. That's an emotion. It shouldn't have any part in our response. It does. Why? 
is because we have not learned the art of that simple scripture that we might know how to answer every man. Now again, I say to you, we all say, and it's too hard, can't change, that's the way we are. You go into the military and apply for a position, I'm telling you, they look for the most arrogant, the most strongest, some of the most um, grotesque men. In fact, in the Second World War and in many wars and nations, do you know where they get their literal? Absolutely. They go in and they strike a deal with all the prisoners and they pick the hardest of criminals, murderers, and they say to them, now listen, we want a tutor you to be a spy. Why? Because they know these guys are not going to be afraid of anything. And they'll train them and they'll say, here's the deal. You will have your sentence of life commuted if you will come under training. So they take the worst, the most arrogant, the most vile, they will take the absolute most rebellious. And I said, now here's the deal. Are you willing to sign a contract? The guy said, yes. If I kind of give me my freedom, I'm prepared to do it. Right. I sit him down. I said, right, from here on in, you're signing your life over to us. And the moment that guy then rebels against the command that is given to him, he'll go back into the slammer until he learns. And so they'll come and they'll say, you're ready now to take the command of authority over your life. No. When you're ready, tell us. They don't get an option. They change. If they don't, they remain in prison. But I'm telling you, fear is not an issue with those guys. Most of them are violent and vile and fear nothing. Yet they know and learn authority is something to be respected. And they learn this very principle. How they might know how to answer every man every given situation and they're trained and they're taught. If they can learn it, with their attitude or problem, we can learn it. The problem is we allow our emotion and our reactions to control us and we do not submit to the truth of the Word of God. We of all people should have a greater mandate to do these things than any other group of people on earth. Now, that's just simply remote viewing. I could go in and I could tell you many, many things that are being experimented and found and discovered right now and I'm going to show you some on a slide here. Now you may or may not know but for some time they have been working on this and the guy that discovered this is not the guy that really discovered it, a Japanese man. He developed the technique how to understand it more and then followed it through more intensely. But in Stanford research in the 1960s, they brought in a book. But they brought in, sorry, a whole lot of men and a whole lot of professors. And they worked on this. And this is what triggered this. And what they did, I have a book at home. Let me explain to you the background to it. When I had a property in Omaru in New Zealand, we had moved to Auckland and for 13 years I could not sell that property. I had done a whole d subdivision there. I'd put roadway in and I developed a couple of houses on it, built them up and it was going down the side of a hill. I uh, subdivided the whole thing and got my dozers and so forth and went in, subdivided this whole thing, a whole layout and put my own subdivision in. Built one house on it, then another, two, both two-story houses on it. And we couldn't sell it. Moved to Auckland for 13 years, couldn't sell it. And I had to put tenants in it. I got a phone call from my lawyer in Omaru to tell me that the actual tenants had moved out and the house had just about been demolished. Now it was a brand new house, and I mean a nice house. Three-story home overlooking the ocean, big ranch sliders looking out over the sea, built on three levels, an absolutely exquisite house. I built it myself. <coughs> we went down there. The house literally was demolished. 
not externally, internally. Holes in the walls, doors literally ripped off their hinges. Some of them, holes smashed right through them. They had had some whale parties there. There was this brand new carpet that I'd put in the house and down the hallway, it was a long hallway the way I designed the house and they had been playing cricket, indoor cricket, down the hallway. And here where they had this line drawn across the carpet and the pitch, they had literally whacked this huge big hole and we finally found out later from one of the lawyers that lived there, Phil will know about it, they had been playing cricket in there. Now, here's the point. I was told by the lawyer to go down there because the place is demolished. So we went down there and I spent the next two to three weeks just doing the whole place up again, fixing it and getting it ready to go back on the market to sell. And while I was there, I found all these paperback books, dozens of them, and they were just left in the house and just heaps of them in the garage. And Daphne and I went down there to clean this place out. And we were chucking all these books into the rubbish, paperback novels and all this stuff. And I threw a book in and I felt the Spirit of the Lord say, pick it out. Now that type of book was not a book that I considered of interest to me. I threw the book in the rubbish. I went over to the rubbish bin I picked it up and I pulled it back out. Do you know what it was called? I've still got the book. This is its title. Black Magic, The Science of the Future. Written back in the 50s. Still got the book. I could show it to you. It's in my library. I won't give it away because I don't think I could ever replace it again. But what it did, it went through all the experiments that were conducted in Stanford Research Institute. The dates, the people that were involved, and they were explaining things then in metaphysics that they did not understand. One of the things that they found was, and this is what they were researching, they said, what is it? What is it that actually takes place when a padre or a priest comes and prays over somebody. What actually happens? So they developed what was then a form of photography that some of you may have heard of. It's weird, it's unusual, but I believe you're dealing with the spirit realm here. And what it is called is Carillion photography. Anybody heard of it? Carillion photography. And what they do is they photograph and it comes out on the negative more than on the positive and they film the actual magnetic resonance and they can pick up the aura around people's lives. They can pick up this light wave and we in the church have laughed and scoffed and mocked them. Auras, man, you're into the weird, you're into the occult. No, you're not. It's been taken by the occult and used to their advantage, but the truth of it is, what you're actually seeing is the realm of the spirit. Do you know what they actually went and did? And it's all documented. I can show you the book, take you through it, and explain it all to you. And that's what set me on the path to learning some of this. Because what they did is they went into a lot of the actual returned vet. Um, you know, the... Uh, American uh, Vietnam and vets. And here in a lot of the hospitals where they had amputated legs and arms, they asked them, can we film you? So under Carillion photography, they filmed the individual person. Do you know what they found? The amputated arm under Carillion photography is still there. All the limbs are still attached. Because what is lost in the natural is not severed in the spirit. That's why what you can destroy on earth with the body, you can't destroy in the spirit in hell. People tell me hell doesn't exist. I say, you don't know what you're talking about. 
Jehovah's Witness come to my door and knock on my door and tell me hell is not a reality? Get real, man. The truth of it is, if you understood science, you wouldn't be stating the stupid statements you're stating. Because already, what you're saying is absolutely obsolete. Nonsense. It exists, and you can film it. And if you can see it under Karelian photography, that's what our modern MRI scans are developed off. Magnetic resonance imaging. That's how it works. And in the spirit realm, even though the physical limb is not attached anymore, it's still operating under Karelian photography. It's there. Because you can't destroy the spirit. People say, hell's not forever because the spirit is not eternal. Neither is the soul. Think again, my friends. Truth of it is, it is. Absolutely. Now, in this particular book, gives all the dates, the professors, all the people that were involved. They asked the question and they said, then what takes place when a priest comes and prays over a Holy Communion? What actually happens? When he goes and ministers that communion to people, and there are cases where people have got healed, what actually happened? When they've gone and they've prayed over situations, things take place that can't be seen in the physical, but I wonder whether it can be seen in the spiritual. So they started to develop all these experiments. And do you know what they found? The crystals on the form of polluted water when prayed over by a priest suddenly formed a glowing cross. I can show you the photographs. Switch it on, mate. The power of the spoken word, you have no idea the power you have. You have no idea the ability that you and I have been given from a creative God to recreate life. And the interesting thing about it is, see that at the top? There is the crystal of a polluted water in a dam before prayer was offered. And the whole of the crystal of the water is distorted and corrupted. Now show after prayer. Look at that. That's the actual crystals filmed under MRI scanning and it's a perfect snowflake back to its original creation. And all they did is just got some preacher who believed what he was praying and spoke as he prayed a prayer over polluted water. Show me another one, man. Do you know what that one is? Look at the top. The effect of water while heavy metal music is being played in its surroundings. And the whole thing is distorted. There is nothing of any sequence, significance, nothing of any order, total disorder. Now, show it after prayer. If you can find the right one. No, that was the one before. But you can go through all of these sequences of all of these pictures and you know what they found? Take a glass of polluted water right upon it just a piece of paper just right upon it I appreciate you get a piece of sellotape stick it around the water come and have a look at the crystals in the next morning. And that's what you find. All the polluted, distorted, corrupted crystals all form back into their original shape. The power of the spoken word. Now I'm telling you this and not all of this is Christian. 
they have recognized in the new age that you have in your innate being somehow when we were created the power to change our environment. Each one of us has that, whether we are renewed by the Spirit or not. That innate ability is within us because we were created in the image of God. Look at that one. Look at the word up the top. Written on the actual glass of water were the words written, You make me sick, I will kill you. That's the result of the crystal. Totally deformed, malformed and misshaped. There it is, after. Appreciation was spoken over it. You say, you've got to be joking. Do you understand the power of your words? I think I do, do, but I don't. When I saw this, I began to realise we have no idea of the creative Ability. The absolute. Okay, there's another one. Just name the name. Over the water. Committed it to that name. And you can go through. I just asked Nathan just to select a few off the website just to show you. But one of the amazing things is. Okay? You don't realise what you're submitting yourself to. But under grunge music, heavy metal, and all of the rest of it, the whole of the, the, the crystals in water totally distorted, corrupted. But the moment they started to play, all these old classics the crystals all began to reshape into their original form. And the interesting part about it is the polluted water came clean. You check it out. It's amazing. Just by the sound of spoken words, we have no idea what we possess. Now the world is digging into this stuff and they understand in the new age how it works. You and I don't just have that innate God-given ability within our being. We are the sons and daughters of God who are now quickened by the Spirit and made alive in Christ. And what does Romans tell us? It tells us this, that you have been quickened in your mortal body, physical body, corruptible body, and a spirit that is placed in there to quicken you and make you alive now, through that quickened spirit, you are able to speak life and change your environment. Do you understand the prophetic word now? By speaking words over people's life, I have seen it over 40 years of my life totally turn and change the direction of people over and over and over again. Now, I'm nothing. I'm not saying it to blow my trumpet. I am as astounded as you are as to the power of the speech God gives us. Now, some of you here have heard my friend when he came here, Ari Muntz. Ari is Dutch or German, actually, descent. Extremely, extremely wealthy family. In fact, one of the wealthiest families in all of Holland and Germany. They owned all the big shipbuilding plants all through there. His parents are multi, multi, multi millionaires. He walked away from it all. Walked away from it all. Lives up in Hong Kong. 
That guy, most of you don't realise, is the second highest qualified physics degree holder in the world. If you sit down with Ari and try to talk to him, you most of the time won't have a clear understanding as to what he's talking about. He's talking information that is up here. But I love sitting with Ari. Very, very close and dear friend. That guy is trained in physics and holds the highest degree in Notre Dame University. And if you go onto any of the science websites, you'll find articles there written by Ari challenging many of the top, top scientists and physicists. He's got a brain like you wouldn't believe. I love to talk about these things too. So we spar. Problem is, I normally take Daphne up with me or somebody else when we go to Hong Kong and the truth of it is, I've got to kick him out of my bedroom at about 3 o'clock in the morning because he won't shut up. <laughs> but he's a good friend. I love him dearly. The point that I'm saying here is as I began to research some of this stuff, I began to find the power of the spoken word, not just in me, in you. God created us with his creative spirit within us and you have no idea of what you possess in this mortal body that you have, that you live in. And if that spirit can find a way through this physical mortal body and quicken you and make you alive, I'm telling you, you will transform the lives of the people around you. The biggest single issue that we have difficulty with is the fact of believing that God could use us and that I could possess this. And the truth of it is, whether you like it or not, you have it. And if you're born again by the Spirit of God, that ability is not just lying there dormant, innate. It is now ready to be tapped. What's that scripture? How does it go in the book of Romans? The full context of it, I just can't bring it to mind. It quickens us. If the same Spirit that be in Christ Jesus be in you, He shall quicken your mortal body. There it is. And the word quicken means to make alive, electrify. And if the same spirit that dwells in Christ be in you, the end result will be that you will be electrified and made alive, quickened. That's right. That's right. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwell in you. He shall quicken your mortal body. There it is. You and I possess it. The problem is, we can listen to all of these things, and then we go home and debate it. <laughs> it's the truth of it. Oh, God couldn't do that with me. Ah, oh, you know, I just, oh man. You know, I can believe that's somebody else. But for me, oh, come on. You know, I don't have the knowledge. I don't have the confidence. I don't have this and have that and I don't have the other. The truth of it is we talk ourselves out of what is literally made alive in us. And instead of trusting God and stepping out, And changing our environment, we would rather let our environment oppress and control us. I want to just quickly end by mentioning some of these significant scriptures to you. In Genesis chapter 11, now we're going right back to the very dawn of creation here. In Genesis 12, God speaks to Abraham and the Bible says in Genesis 12 verse 5 And Abraham took Sarai his wife and Lot his brother's son and all their substance that they had gathered and the souls that had gotten 
in Haran. And they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. At the command of God, he got up and he went. There's the issue. We heard it this morning. Obedience. We don't want to do it. Mostly because we're afraid. We lack confidence. We don't think it'll work. We don't think God could use us. Abraham back there in the dawning of history got a word from God. Get up. Verse 1. Chapter 12. Leave your kindred. Leave your kinsfolk. Leave this country. Go to a, to a land in a country that I'll show you off. So he got up and he went. He simply was obedient. Did what he was told. And the end result was, verse 6, And Abraham passed through the land unto the place of Sichem, unto the plain of Moreh. And the Canaanite was then in the land. The Canaanite. The Canaanite already was in the land. Who's the Canaanite? The Canaanite you'll see them all named in Genesis 22. There was the Perizzite, the Kenite, the Jebusite, the Hittite, the Amalekite. All the ones that the children of Israel had problems with when they went into the Promised Land. Same people, same groups, same nations. The Canaanite, if you understand in Scripture, and I don't want to get into this, but as the offspring of the angelic perversion of creation tells you who they are and you see them before the flood and when Joshua goes into the land under Moses and even uh, 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 into the land sorry under God and Moses before him as they're coming across the wilderness encounter all of these same nations again and God says slay them all take them out, the whole blooming lot. Every man, woman and child. You think, man, this is gross. Why would God do that? Because what you don't realise is this is demonic offspring. You can't regenerate them. And here they were before the flood and it names them the Hittite, the Jebusite, the Amalekite, the Hivite. All of them. Perizzite. And here they are again in the promised land. What's it saying? They are what the scripture calls the Rephaim who have no beginning and no end. They're eternal. Because that's what the word Rephaim means. They're God men. I don't care what people think and how stupid it sounds and what people and scientists will try and tell me that it's ridiculous and it's mystical and it's all nonsense. That's the truth. That's what the word says and that's the facts. And the same nations that were wiped out before the flood ended up again developing in the land after the flood. And the scripture makes it clear that that happened twice, both before the flood and after the flood. Here they are. These nations, the Canaanites, were then in the land. What am I saying? I am saying that when God tells you to go out and do a thing and to begin to speak the creative word that God has given you, the first thing you will encounter is you start to move into the land and possess the gift of God, you'll find the Canaanite will approach you. Immediately. And you think, oh man, I can't do this. Oh man, you know, I fear. You need to recognize who it is and what it is. It's the enemy that is binding you up. And it's interesting, when you study those names, they all have different meanings. I can't remember what they are now, but I've got them listed down somewhere. The uh, Hittite and the Jebusite and all the rest of it. Some of them mean uh, rebellion. Others of the name literally mean some um, you know, insolence and stubbornness and hatred and murder and all of those names have a spirit that presides in them and that spirit is the significant thing and the moment you rise up to go in and possess the land and to speak now hear me hear me the most difficult thing that uh, that uh, psychologists tell us to do for any person to do is to speak publicly it's the greatest fear 
Isn't it interesting? The creative word that is within you that you might know how to address every man. The creative word, God is relying upon you to be the deliverer of it. But the first thing you do, you go to take the very first step. God calls and says, get up from where you are, out of the country of your security. Move into this land that I will show you of. The first thing you have to do is be obedient and go and do it. The second thing you must realize is this, that you will be contended with. The very first thing you will find is the Canaanite will be in the land. He's already positioned himself in a, in a place to challenge you. He knows what you're about and he knows who you are. You're an ambassador from another land, another country. And he will immediately position himself to oppose you, to attack you. We understand it. The truth of it is, we all succumb to it. So God tells him, go in, possess. So he goes in. That's Genesis chapter 12, verse 6. But if you go to Genesis 15, you'll see it here. God speaks in verse 18. In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abraham. Covenant, a promise. And if you are the sons and ears of faithful Abraham, Galatians 4 tells us you are the recipients of the same promise as faithful Abraham. So it's not just to him, it's to you and I. I'm not twisting this. I am preaching scripture to you. And here it is. And the Lord made this covenant and said to him, Unto your seed I have given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. Verse 19, the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim. Here's this word, without beginning, without end. God meant. It's translated many ways in the Old Testament. Right through the book of Isaiah you'll find it and the way it's translated there is the deceased. And it says in our day upon earth in Isaiah 28 your dead men shall awake. And you have a look at it and the word is the Rephaim. You check out the word and the reference in that it is the word deceased. Those who are deceased shall come forth from the grave, from the pit, and shall awake in the earth in the last day. I'm telling you, you better realize what you're up against. Because this whole spirit of these God men is about to walk forth. And I believe it's already started. Go into the book of Revelation, it tells you the roof or the lid of the abyss will be taken off and every foul, filthy spirit will go forth deceiving the nations before the Lord comes. Enough said on that subject. But let me say this. Mentions them there. And the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Girgashites and the Jebusites. Here they are all. All of them. And they are the ones positioned there to oppose the promise of God given to Abraham. Do you think that you're any better than Abraham? No, no. The same enemies that challenged him are the same enemies who will challenge the promise of God's word to you. Fear will be the issue, no matter what frame it comes in. What will they think? Oh, the people think I'm stupid. I'm not educated. Oh, I couldn't say that. No matter who it is and what spirit it is that comes to put you down, the whole motivation is to shut you up. Silence the word that God is giving you to deliver. Go then to Genesis chapter 22. And you'll see it there again. Verse 1, And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham, put him to the test. It doesn't mean he tempted him, but he allowed Abraham to go under trial and said to him, Abraham, 
he said, Behold, here I am. And God allowed him to go under this trial. So go down to verse 17 and look what it says. After he'd gone through the trial and came out shining colors, God begins to speak to him what he said to him in verse 3 of chapter 12. In blessing I will bless you. In multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven and a sand as it is upon the seashore. He's renewing the covenant. He's reminding him what he told him, told him in Genesis 12.3. Remember the promise, Abraham? Remember the promise? It still holds strong. And I say to you, it's the same. And your seed, here it is, your seed. Who's Abraham's seed? Read Galatians 4. It tells you it's you and I. We are Abraham's seed because we are heirs of faith, of the same promise as faithful Abraham. We therefore are the heirs of the seed of the promise as Abraham. Now look what it says. Your seed, who's that? That's you and I. Your seed will possess the gates of his enemies. Now, if it was spoken directly to Abraham, it would be, your seed will possess the gates of your enemies. But it wasn't just pertinent to Abraham or personal to Abraham alone. <laughs> it's to Abraham's seed. So he changes the word and he says there, this promise that I give you is going to allow you to go in and plunder your enemy, and I will give to your seed the gates of the enemy for an inheritance. So he's not talking to Abraham, he's talking to you and I. Remember, I'm talking about the power of the spoken word, realizing who you are and what you are. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. All nations. Jews? No, no. All nations. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because thou hast obeyed my voice. When I told you to go, you went. Okay? The issue is, as we heard this morning, was obedience. Do what God tells you to do. And don't be afraid. Because you will be amazed what comes out of your mouth. And there have been many times where I've delivered a prophetic word and I thought, Shlip. what if that doesn't happen? What if I was just imagining something? What if I say this and I deliver that word? What if? If you start to consider the what ifs, you won't say or do anything. But as you are in humility and you're trying to find your feet as a humble servant of God and you feel the quickening of God's Spirit within you and as He quickens this mortal body you deliver what you sense God is putting upon your heart. Lord, help me here. Help me. I don't want to believe a lie. I don't want to be an error. I don't want to say something that is offensive. I don't want to say something is not your will, but Lord, help me. And as I focus on something or someone, God starts to just drop little thoughts into my heart and I start to share it. And I tell you, I have literally called people by name. I've named dates and places and things in people's lives all across this world. And I can take you to every nation upon the face of this earth just about now to somebody in that nation that I prophesied or spoke a prophetic word over their life and they'll tell you as I go there, they will greet me and ask me to come and have a meal with them or whatever because I impacted their life. I get the glory for it, but it wasn't me, it was God. All I did was step out in obedience and deliver what I felt God was saying was appropriate for that moment. And I shared it. But I end up with many of the benefits. And so consequently, in some nations, they know exactly who they are, that I am, and it gets me into doors now in nations because I'm well enough known because of it. I said, Brian's coming to town, you know. 
and I've been blessed enough to get the honour for it. It wasn't me. I'm no different from you. I've always lacked confidence in my life as a young man coming into ministry. I struggled with fear and apprehension. My only saving grace is that I will not. I will not give up. I'll keep pressing through and no matter how many times I humiliate myself and no matter how many times I make a mistake, I'll get up and keep going until I beat it. And it won't rule my life. But I'm the same as you. I go home and I say something and I say, oh man, you idiot. Why did you say it like that? You could have said some better words. You could have chosen some better words. You dipstick. And I analyse everything I do. That's the way I am. So I know most of you do that. But if you allow that to rule your life so you don't say or speak anything, you will never impact any life. Faith requires that we step out and be obedient to God, deliver what we sense God is giving. And we might make mistakes, but the truth of it is, I'm telling you, you will impact lives as well. And if you do it in humility, they'll receive it. When I started my journey moving into the prophetic, I would come to people and I thought, you know... What if I say something that's wrong? I thought, well, the best way to deliver this is to let them know that I'm human. And I would say, my brother, I may be wrong, but I'm standing here and I sense a scripture in my heart. I sense to share this with you. So I share the word and I say to them, is it right? And already the tears are running down their cheeks. And I know straight off, it's hit with a nail on the head. So... So there's ways of doing and delivering this. That's what that scripture in Colossians tells us. That you might know how to answer every man. There's a way of doing it. And you will impact and touch lives. No question about it. Absolutely no question about it. Let me quickly move on as we come to a close. I touched that one in Genesis, yes. All right. I want you to just turn here and let's end here. And it's in Numbers 14, 28. It's when the children of Israel are going into the promised land and there are 12 spies sent in. Ten come back and they say, we can't do this. We just can't do this. The people out there, they're giants. Beautiful land, but they're giants. There's no way we're going to be able to compete with them. If you're looking at your natural ability, of course you won't, but if you are quickened in your mortal body by the power of the Spirit, yes, you can. You can take them on, and as Joshua and Caleb said, let them be bread for us. Let's eat them. We can take them down. No question. you just got to believe that God is well able to do it. They are bread for us. Okay. But the ten came back and they enticed the people. And the people then gave up heart and they heard the negative word. All they heard was the impossibility, what they couldn't do. And that's what they embraced. Joshua and Caleb said, do not be so foolish. Do you not understand God didn't bring you out here to let you die in the wilderness? He said, God brought us out here to take us in and we are well able to go up and take the country. No question. You've just got to believe in God. You've just got to trust God. No matter how many times your knees knock, get up and get going. God is well able. But the people chose to listen to the ten spies with a negative report. Now look what God says. As surely as you have said, so will I do. Who determined it? God or them? Verse 28. Say to the children of Israel, as truly as I live, saith the Lord, as you have spoken in my ears, so I will do to you. You said it. That's the outcome. 
if nature and the crystals of the water can be purified because of your speech, if nature itself can align itself and be corrected and recreated by the power of your spoken word, do you not believe that God can literally change all of nature? He's the God of the impossible. But more importantly, He is the God of creation. And if God sitting in the spirit realm listens to us who are in the physical realm, let me just make a point here. We talk about possible and impossible. God looks down to this physical world and says, Son, daughter, what are you on about? Physical, uh, sorry, possible, impossible. Impossible is not a word to a creative God. It doesn't even enter his vocabulary. See? So, whose perspective are you looking from? Go and tell a creator God that something is impossible. What do you think he'll do to you? He'll rebuke you and say, don't be so foolish. Don't be ridiculous. Do you not understand who I am? I'm a creator. And anything that needs recreating or needs an answer to a situation, I am a creator. See? The word impossible is not even a word that is in God's vocabulary. Because to a creator, nothing is impossible. That's why Jesus said, all things are possible with God. But he didn't stop there. He says, all things are possible unto him that believes. So if science has found that the crystals of polluted water and affected by negative things and sources in nature can be corrected by the power of the spoken word and you who are quickened in your mortal body have the power not only innate what was given you when you were born as a human individual because the nature of God is in you but you by the power of Christ have been quickened and made alive do you not think that you are able through the power of God to recreate? You are. Absolutely you are. You just don't know your potential. That's the situation. And fear is the thing that's held us bound. You know, it amazes me. At times I have struggled, prayed for people for healing, seen nothing happen, so convinced myself, oh, well, it can't be. Or God doesn't want me to pray for somebody that's sick. And so we convince ourselves that it's just not for me. So we give up. And so we don't prophesy. We don't operate a word of knowledge. We don't operate the gifts of God because it's me. It's just not for me. The Bible tells me God is no respecter of persons. He's not going to do for you what he won't do for me. It's exactly the same with every man. And then it says, remember this, James, Elijah was a man of like passion, just like you and I. And he sought the Lord, and the Lord shut up heaven that it rained not. And he prayed again, and God opened heaven that it rained. Then he said, he's a man just like you and I. What's it saying? It's saying what Elijah did, you can do. You just don't believe that he can. The issue is not God's ability, it's your fear and my fear. That's the issue. Well, it's time all this changed. 
And I believe we're on the threshold of crossing over into a new era where the sons of God will begin to arise and be made manifest in the earth. And I believe that you and I need to begin to walk away from our fears and leave them behind us. And the power of your spoken word can recreate, can heal. If they can do it with water and change the whole crystal structure of impure water that the whole of the source and foundation of life depends upon, if they can do that to the very foundation of what you absolutely need to survive, surely God can do it with your physical being. Absolutely. The power of the spoken word. Stand with me and I want to pray. We just don't understand who we are. And I believe we are going to learn who we are. Stretch your hands toward heaven. A sign of receptivity, a sign of allegiance, and a sign of submission. Willingness to receive. Lord, here we stand tonight in faith but also in obedience. Lord, we ask, quicken us. Make our spirits alive. And how does that happen? By helping us to realize just who we are. We are not just human beings. We are not even just offspring of parents and nations. We are the sons and daughters of the living God, created in your image. And in us dwells the Spirit of the Most High God. So Lord, tonight as we stretch our hands toward heaven, we ask, Lord, forgive us for our unbelief but inspire us and and challenge us that we might step out upon the water of faith and walk on it. Knowing, Lord, that what you speak results happen. And by believing your word and that which you speak as we speak it also, it will take place if we do not doubt. And Lord, I'm reminded of that scripture as you walked that day and they looked and marveled who followed you. And they said, Master, look, the fig tree that you cursed at the beginning of the day has now withered and died. Jesus said, I say unto you, if you will speak to this mountain, and say be plucked up by the roots and be cast into the depth of the sea and do not doubt in your heart but believe you shall have whatever you say. Father, tonight, help us that we might speak the creative word and keep speaking it and keep speaking it until our hearts are convinced that, Lord, that which we speak, empowered by your Spirit, will come to pass. So help us, Lord, that we might step out of our comfort zones, start to begin to move into this realm of the creative. When we see people sick, speak the word over them. When we see people that are broken, speak the word over them. When we see people that are struggling, speak the word over them. Oh God, help us that we might deliver the creative word through the word of knowledge, the word of wisdom, or the prophetic gift. And set in motion a whole new path down which people can walk. And let it not be said that fear on our part hindered those people from walking that path because we were afraid to give them the direction and speak the word. Father, I pray tonight 
anchor these words in our heart and help us to step out in faith and believe. Lord, you are a creative God and we are created in your image. Quickened by your Spirit, therefore the creative ability of God rests in us and dwells in us. We thank you for it, Lord. Help us to become accountable for it. We ask in Jesus' name. You say amen? Hope that was a help. Bless you. Have a coffee.